Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. I met Christopher Rogers some 15 years ago or so when I was a lobbyist and he was working for an online fundraising platform. Nearly two decades have rolled by and how the world of work, play, tech, online sales and everyday transactions have changed very much. Christopher is a highly regarded tech leader who is recognised as a thought leader in emerging payments and technology innovation. He is currently Global Chief Payments Officer is at Eonx Technologies, I got that right, the publicly listed fintech growth company focused on developing the next generation of e-wallet payments and loyalty solutions. This role follows his appointment as Australian CEO of Eonx Services in November 2022, the local subsidiary pair partnering with MasterCard to develop their new account-to-account payments solution. Prior to this role, Chris was General Manager ANZ at Mambu, a $5 billion value core banking platform provider. In November 2019, he was announced as Startup Executive of the Year at the CEO Magazine's Executive of the Year Awards for his work as CEO of Zepto, formerly known as Split Payments, which he led from launch to becoming a market leader in direct, debit and real-time payment solutions leveraging open banking. He's also a non-executive director and board member of Ferros Care, a disability and aged care provider helping people grow bold with better care and technology. He presents on future trends in tech across the globe and is also a strategic advisor on fundraising and social impact for corporates and not-for-profits. So away from the tools, he's a keyboard warrior of the piano playing kind and father to three kids and lives at the moment in Barmy Byron Bay, one of Australia's most popular sea change destinations with his wife and obviously his family. So welcome to the politics of everything, Chris. Thanks so much, Amber. It's an absolute pleasure to be back with you. Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since 2017, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one web-based solution to make the process quick and painless, the way podcasting should be. If you know me, I'm pretty obsessed with quality guests, quality content and quality sound, and that's what Zencaster allows me to do. Not to mention, it's really easy to use, even for my guests that aren't particularly tech savvy. There's nothing to download. They just click on the link and we start recording. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy and with everything from local recording to automatic post-production all in the one tool, you don't have to leave your browser to get each episode done. I want you to have the same great experience that I do for all my podcasts and content needs. So I have a special offer for you. If you go to Zen dot AI forward slash politics of everything and enter this promo code, you'll get 30% off in your first three months when you sign up to Zencaster Pro. That's Z E N dot AI oh, politics of everything. It's now time to share your story. And it has been a minute, hasn't it? I mean, I'm thinking, you know, 15 years ago, uh, we, we kind of took our bank card, you know, down to the ATM and then we, we worried about ch- being charged if we weren't using, you know, our Westpac AP- ATM with our Westpac card. And then I think even sometimes checks were exchanged back in those days. Yeah. So um, the world of payments has certainly changed. It really has. And these days we're, we're tapping and going, you know, it just has changed fundamentally. I haven't had a wallet for a few years now and that just didn't seem real back then, right? And we're talking a blink and you'll miss it period of time, and not eons. So, yeah, it's, it's scary, <laughs> this, this, this speed of innovation these days, isn't it? Absolutely. So I'm going to go back to your childhood, and I don't think when we met 15 years ago I would have ever asked you this question, so I always love hearing from my guests about what they wanted to be when they were a kid. You know, was it an astronaut? I don't know that it was an investment banker. Who knows? But do you remember what your childhood ambitions were and kind of how you kind of built on that idea and where you ended up, I guess, in your early career? 
yeah, look, I've always wanted to be in payments, said nobody ever. <laughs> so, um, you know, predictably, I wanted to be a rock star. But my parents really helped with that with that uh, ambition. And at a very early age, I learned the piano. I actually studied commercial music, Amber, at, at university in, in, in the UK. Uh, wow. And my early career was indeed in producing music. And uh, to such an extent that I actually had some commercial um, success early in the day penning a couple of uh, songs that went on to be quite significant hits. So to all intents and purposes, I was all set. But I think I realized I wasn't cool enough to have a music career. But <laughs> what I did love about music was the technology, you know, producing music and, and sampling and all the software. I think music was one of the early adopters of, of tech innovation. So it, it kicked off my career in building technology companies, you know, from the online platform you spoke of, the the online giving platform to the companies I'm involved with and founded uh, more recently. So yeah, music, I wanted to be a star. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're kind of novels. a star, you're, you're a tech payments yeah, CEO tech. star. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. No, I'm proud of what we've done, but it, it, it certainly isn't, you know, being an astronaut or being a musician. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky and we are lucky in Australia, actually, that it's a really good incubator of, of, of ideas. And it's easier than a lot of regions to to kick off a great idea and turn it into a successful business. So yeah, in one way, I, I love celebrating that part. So yeah, okay, I'll take that, Amber. <laughs> so <laughs> how would you describe the modern payment system where we are at in 2022? And in your sort of narrative, if you like, what has fundamentally changed over the last few decades? And there are a couple of examples maybe of, you know, those high points of, of change along the way. Yeah, look, and, and for the listeners, I'll try and not point out the obvious and, and, and try and put in some politics of payments to to frame where we are today, because we are in a really significant or arguably generational point of change when it comes to banking and payments. So it is a really interesting time. But to be honest, I don't think payments has changed for centuries. If you really think about what a payment is, it's it's a value exchange in return for goods or services. And, you know, we used to do that with sheeps and goats. We <laughs> then, then did it with precious metals, uh, gold and, and silver. And then only relatively or comparatively recently, we moved to what we call fiat currency, which is basically, you know, government issued currency. But let's think about it. It's all the same. It's just an exchange of value to get what we want. What has changed, in my opinion, recently is not just the technology, and I'd love to touch on that a little during this episode, but it, it's more about adding value to the payment. So it's you know accruing rewards for your payments. It's adding data to your payments. Think about fintechs these days that immediately identify your receipts in your banking statement. Think about open banking. A consumer has real-time visibility over what a payment is doing and what it's creating for you in terms of amplified value. So for me, that's a really interesting point. You know, we're all obsessed about rewards and cashing them in and, you know, you, you know, getting your, your rewards for, for um, holidays and, and plane tickets, you know. So that's something I think has become very exciting. And maybe we expect it a little bit because you create that yeah. need. And I guess the, the companies that aren't doing that sort of reward exchange and just doing basic transactions will probably fall behind perhaps in, in the near future. That's exactly it. And think a few decades ago, this was the success of a card like Amex when you're talking credit cards, because you got so much with your transaction. You and I look for credit cards where we get better points accrual um, or travel insurance bundled. So yeah, we, we want that, I guess, if a, a younger Australian uh, would want instant gratification, they want it and they want it now. And yeah. that's why things like buy now, pay later have emerged as, as trends. But um, yeah, it's 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 we want more now because we've become far more astute as consumers. So businesses can no longer dupe us with their fancy advertising slogans. We 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 can see through it now, and payments is at the at the front end of of that experience as a consumer. So banks are still powerful holders of, say, our mortgages, our loans, um, and I guess for some people they still still see them as the most stable businesses that customers can rely on to put their savings into, to issue credit cards, to do all sorts of transactions with. But has the rapid rise of a raft of new and alternative players upended that significantly or is the share of the pie still largely with, you know, the kind of banks and brands that we grew up with as kids? 
Yes. Look, banks are still the bastion of our wallet, right? And I, I don't think that's changed. And if we think about Australia in particular, the banks are actually not doing a bad job. And that might trigger some of some of your listeners, but um, obviously with the scrutiny of the- oh, We love the- to hate the banks, you know, yes. and I, obviously I worked, um, I've worked in, in crisis comms with a couple of entities during the Banking Royal Commission of 2018, and it was pretty yes. eye-watering, but the reality is they kind of are doing better than ever. <laughs> That's, That's exactly it. On. And in fact, um, my experience at Mambu, so they, they were, they still are, sorry, a you know, an, a, a core banking software provider. And I used to walk the corridors of CBA, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, regularly as we were selling into them. And I saw the best tech talent on the floor. I saw the best teams of agile developers with the best aspirations for great digital banking. The problem is a bank like CBA is a, is a ship that can't turn very quickly. Mm. And then all these fintechs are speedboats that can just spin out a new product and get it into market as a minimum viable product very quickly. And they can outpace banks. So to your question, look, I think banks will always continue to play an important part. But then I don't know how many consumers actually realize that your deposits within a bank are guaranteed. Right, that's why they are approved and regulated. Yes. I'm seeing younger consumers not caring about that anymore. They they don't even. I, I'd love to do a snap poll about how many consumers actually realise that the banking industry has got these guarantees in place. And that's why we did so well, say during the GFC, for example, or that's you know right. during even you know some other tough times in our economy, because we are so protected here. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And look, I take solace in that as a, a more sophisticated investor these days, and. Uh, So to that end, I think, and like I said, in Australia, the banks are good. In some regions where I've worked, they're not so good and therefore maybe are more ripe for disruption. But what I see as a trend is is that banks are pivoting. They just can't pivot fast enough. There are the disruptors that consumers will rally to for a better experience. And that's our days at Zepto. That's what we did. And, And there's still a big fintech ecosystem that are taking on the banks and there's enough market share there, Amber, for fintechs to do really well. You know, a 2% market share is worth over a billion dollars. So there will be success with fintechs. But unfortunately, I'm quite conservative in my statement when I say banks have a, a, play, you know, a part to play in this story. They just have to innovate faster. Absolutely. And look, I'm just thinking about my own banking practices. I hold more than one bank account and they're with different banks. So there's a place for my, the equivalent of my CBA, one of my big four banks, but then I've also got, you know, an ESG kind of savings account and I've got other sorts of players, which are sort of not household names, but I just like what they do and how they offer their services. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And again, if we open anyone's smartphone these days, you probably will find a couple of neobanks, one major bank, one financial well-being tool, one Acorn Saver app that sort of tops up your purchases and puts that into savings. Yeah, there's heaps. Um, They are everywhere. I guess, therefore, how do they read each other? How do they, and it's what I call platformication, Um, a successful technology sits within an environment where a consumer wants to live. Now, whether that's your phone or whether it's a metaverse like Fortnite, the successful payments companies will live within that environment and 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 interact with a consumer on their terms. That's something quite radical that I'm seeing happen a lot. But yeah, we're not we're, we're app agnostic, right? We'll use what we find good, yes. and if it continues to be good, we're sticky and we'll stay with them. And that, that's really important to understand from, from any. Yeah, we're pretty loyal once you're there. Even I'm just reflecting even a um, couple of the, you know, post-Royal Commission, a couple of scandals um, from some of the big four banks and there was so much media attention and outrage, you know, there might have been money laundering that was going to child trafficking or, you know, various things and people were really outraged. But I guarantee hardly any of them moved their money out of that bank because it's just a bit hard. Like you say, it's a very sticky relationship. That's right. And, you know, let's be a bit controversial here and that's why the dollar Dolomite account. I'm not going to pick on any particular. Oh, yes. Right, but, you know, get them when they're young. It's like uh, the tobacco companies of yesteryear, right? <laughs> let's just get you in and then it's going to, let's make it real hard to go away. How do you cancel a direct debit? It used to be near on impossible. <laughs> I know. You can do it so easily now. I think we've got more power. But in the appeal of the disruptor payment system that we're talking about, and I guess that ecosystem that you're privy to just because of all the work that 
that you've been involved with. Do you see it as fairly generational and do entities know this and how they market their businesses and I guess the, the, the things that they offer in that suite of products and services? So, for example, Gen Xs like us and boomers, for example, might be less likely to use buy now, pay later. I can actually categorically tell you I've never used it um, <laughs> as I buy things, but, you know, all the millennials and Gen Zs, that's kind of the, you know, main way they get things now, like you say, and don't wait. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree that, of course, as a marketer, and I'm, I'm a closet marketer, um, you do target a demographic with specific messaging, right? But with that said, think about how digital we've all become. And maybe the pandemic has got something to do with that. I mean, I, as you mentioned in the intro, I'm, I'm a board member of Ferros Care. And one of the biggest growth areas of, of that age care provider and disability care provider is a social, a, a virtual social center. So every day you have all these dialing in to a mahjong session or bingo in a virtual room like a Zoom and they're paying for it, they're subscribing to it. So even an older demographic now beyond our generations are embracing technology and consuming technology to connect in ways that they probably never would have imagined. So it's it's becoming a level playing field in terms of, I think, the gen all generations are more digitized than ever. But, you know, so, and the other thing, you mentioned Gen X, boomers, etc. We are at a point where we now have digital natives, people that were born into technology. The internet was a thing when they were- Like all our children who don't remember a time of a fax machine or, you know, dial up internet. That's just foreign to them. But on that, you know, the newer ATMs don't make sounds when they're counting money, but they had to reintroduce <laughs> the sound digitally because people felt uncomfortable that they couldn't hear their money being displayed. So it's 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 behavioral uh, transformation. But these days, generations, uh, all of the generations um, after me, know uh, are seamlessly digital, and we weren't. And so, as our generations move out of the workforce and into retirement, we're going to see just a, a whole different world. To be honest, probably parts of which you and I can't imagine at this point. So how does the business that you're currently in really lead the way in that payment and financial innovation space? I'm not expecting you to give us away give away your trade secrets, but really in a nutshell, what do you do that you think you do so well and perhaps how are you leading the way and maybe changing some of our behaviors that we like you say not even aware is going to happen to us? Yeah, yeah. That's a good question and I'm I'm going to do your listeners proud and not just spruik our wares, but I will speak to you about what generally you know attracted me to joining this company is that we add that value to the money i was talking about earlier so yes we do payments but we also do loyalty so eonx is is, is a loyalty platform provider and so it speaks to that reality where if i transact and pay bills i can accrue rewards that i can then you know earn and burn in a marketplace i can have priceless experiences and we do power mastercards loyalty by the way and I can exchange gift cards for things that I've, I've accrued through payments. So that's a real nice marriage of reward versus money. But to think forward, um, one of the bigger projects we're doing is with MasterCard. Again, we're building out uh, in partnership their account-to-account -account capability. So think about that. A global card scheme provider is pivoting towards bank transfer technology. Mm. But then underwriting it with all the things you expect in a card experience. So security, guarantee, customer protection. But the globe is realizing that we are becoming simpler with payments. And that, I think, is a key trend in that you and I, Amber, we'd much rather just transfer the money via bank account because it's easy, seamless, and cheap. But there isn't yet the technology that makes that the same experience as card. And that's coming. And that's something we're really immersed in at the moment. They have a big team behind building it and launching it later this year. So that's really exciting. So I think we, we play on the innovation side of payments. Doing a payment is doing a payment. A lot of people do that now. But it's adding that value, I think, keeps, you know, makes me wake up in the morning really excited about what we do. Excellent. Well, watch this space. A survey by Finder revealed that buy now, pay later has quickly become one of the most popular ways for people to buy goods and services. And according to figures released by the Reserve Bank in Australia in October 2021, the value of those transactions was equivalent of 1.7% of Australian car purchases in the year to June 2021 last year. 
which provided processing around 11.5 billion. That's an eye-watering number. And of course, there's a whole raft of companies we mentioned after pay. There's Zip, OpenPay, and Klarna, which obviously allow you to buy something straight away, spread the cost over time, and not have to pay any interest. I mean, it sounds too good to be true, and I'm of a vintage that that is always the case, really. So, how do you think this sector really got its grip on customers so quickly? Yes, um, th- this is a minefield or a gold mine, depending on <laughs> how you consider the whole buy now, pay later. And obviously, we champion this by we, I mean, Australia. Um, after pays, you know, halcyon days in the States were preceded by some a- amazing innovation here. But look, I- if you think about buy now, pay later, it's really just lay-by, isn't it? That's what I mean. But lay-by was different because you couldn't take it home. Do you remember? I remember going in yeah. and paying off my lay-by my first job, you know, Absolutely. to pay for something. Absolutely. And I still, up till a few years ago, when I became a victim of buy now, pay later, and I'll speak to that in a moment, I used to do the Christmas shopping lay-by at Kmart. And it was yep. kind of a nice feeling of slowly chipping away at what you know is going to be an awesome bunch of presents for your kids but the danger of buy now pay later is in the market that has taken it up the most your younger australian that doesn't necessarily um, access credit is using this as a means of credit and they're not yet financially astute enough to not fall into that debt trap it makes it so easy to access things right now you know, that instant gratification we were speaking about, mm. and then worry about the financials, financials later. So, you know, the current global macroeconomic conditions are shining a new light on buy now, pay later since that data you just um, told me about was released. So it's in a state of flux, and I don't think it's the beginning of the end, but it's the end of the beginning for buy now, pay later. We're going to go into a more mature state. I don't think it will go away, um, but you know, targeting a young consumer in the fashion arena yes. is a great way to launch it. But if you look at Zip and OpenPay, they're targeting car services and, and even surgery. Wow. Um, <laughs> so they're tapping into new, you know, there's, there's, there's Ink Pay I read about this morning, which is buy now, pay later for tattoos. Wow, so- that's incredible. You're going to be able to put your whole life on some sort of payment plan for the rest of your life. And I think you know, just all those doom and gloom stories which you do see occasionally on tabloid media, which are, you know, they speak the truth of what's happening. People can have multiple of of buy now, pay later things and then realise that even if they did the minimum payments, they don't have enough money for food or rent or Mm. petrol in their car and it's just, you know, it sounds like there's no education around that process and what that really means for you. And and one thing that's kind of an eye-opener for your listeners is that, you know, at Zepto and even now, you know, we use open banking, so we have access to data, payments data, right? Mm. And if you look at a bank statement across our snapshot of of audience, I guarantee you on every single bank statement, you'll find either a a short-term or payday lending uh, loan. Uh, You'll find buy now, pay later, at least two, and then other forms of personal lending. So I think we are becoming very stretched And I worry for a younger Australian being able to handle that. So it's a bit of an eye-opener. The other thing I'll say... And, of course, the credit rating thing. You know, I'm just, as someone who has mortgages and so forth, it's it's always on my mind. What does that do to your credit rating? Of course, of course. And then there's probably a fintech that can help you improve your credit rating. (laughs) Probably. Make it go away. But I used one of the Buy Now, Pay Later apps. I did a $100 purchase, paid it off, great experience. The next time I opened the app, I had a credit of $2,000 to spend. Now, wow. is, is that sensible? Uh, you know, luckily, you know, I am financially literate, but that for me is is a fair. But if you were maybe nineteen, twenty, and yes. there was that money there, it's that- incredibly easy. And hey, you can add that to your wallet on your phone. Tap that credit, literally. Yeah. So it's uh, it's a scary place, and uh, this, and also crypto, and, and what's happening in that area, oh, of course. Is, you know, shining a light on alternative finance. And I'm bullish. I think there's a place for it, but it's got to provide value. Does it give us value? Some instances, I don't know. Absolutely. And just this is obviously not a show on crypto, but I've just been listening to a bunch of podcasts about, you know, the rise of crypto and the fall of crypto and just that scary idea that you could go onto a platform one day that you've been trading on for a while and, and nothing's there. It's just suddenly the rug's been pulled out. That doesn't exist. It just closes down and there goes all your so-called money. So it's a reason why we're so regulated, I guess, in other aspects of our payment system and our banking. No, that's right. And I I think it it needs to be there. That's second only to security as well. I think uh, 
you know, cybersecurity is, is one of the biggest things um, we have to be across and in control of moving forward. So that, that, that plays out a lot in, in the financial sector. It kind of ties into what we've been talking about, but I mean, do you have a view on the ethical and fiscal responsibility of these disruptors in in sectors like afterpay and so forth? Is it it can't just be buyer beware? We have mentioned, of course, we've in a, a state of you know high inflation, cost of living is not going to go down anytime soon, and and this is just a global trend. This is not something that's unique to Australia. But obviously, there's going to be more and more defaults, and so where where does it come in that those these companies have a role to play? Particularly when you're reading that some of their CEOs are the highest paid in the nation. I mean, it sort of it, it rubs me the wrong way in some ways to think that that can be happening at the same time someone might be in, you know, eons of debt over some item which they've probably long forgotten what they bought. That's that's exactly right. And look, the, the timing when we look at you know an era post pandemic of of pretty challenging macroeconomic conditions, we're in a crypto winter apparently at the moment, and that, <laughs> that much is evident when you look at the trends. But um, it's fraught with peril for 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 want of a better sort of statement. And inevitably, areas like buy now pay later will need to be regulated, and most of the providers within that area support that. But I just don't think you can continue to see a social impact it's having without better regulating the industry. I do think buy now, pay later is a legitimate alternative finance or alt finance. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I agree with that. I think that's that's the good bit. it's, It's the good bit, right? And that's why I think I mentioned earlier, you know, there's good and bad and ugly on all sectors. But when it ultimately is about consumer experience and those guys got that right. There's some incredible mm. user experiences. And I, I think that's now king, to be honest. And that's why, you know, you asked ethical, and I think you said fiscal um, responsibility. I mean, as a board member, I take fiduciary duty really seriously. And I think you have to have that duty of care over all aspects of society. Um, but you also have to face the inevitable, that things are changing. Some banks can't keep up. Fintechs are outpacing the market. Consumers are outpacing businesses. You've got to keep up with that tech and not lock it down too draconially, if that's a word, because uh, you'll stifle innovation and, and stifle economic behaviors. So I'm on the fence. I, I think there's a, two sides to that coin. Absolutely. So what's some of the opportunities that you see for the payment system broadly? And essentially, you know, this disruptive technology can be a collaboration, not a competition for some of the incumbents in your own words. So what, what are some of those opportunities, just one or two maybe, that you think will kind of help everybody, you know, not just the companies, but I guess all of us as consumers? I love that word, collaboration. Um, I think that is the future. Um, there's a lot of noise if, if your listeners are into fintech and subscribe to the various um, different blogs about banking as a service. Uh, there's been a few failures of, of, of new neobanks in Australia, so we're shining a light on banking as a service. I think a future of collaboration between the banks and the fintechs is where we are going because the banks provide, you know, how we kicked off this episode, um, that trusted, you know, guaranteed and regulated fiscal environment. But they need the fintechs doing cool things to surround that core banking. So that ecosystem where you can plug and play and put different things that you like in place with a core banking offering is is really exciting. Uh, It's a geek in me coming out, I know. But (laughs) mark, mark my words, banking as a service is something that's beginning to become very important for all merchants who are looking for value add to, to payments so absolutely so that's the big yeah. trend I think we should all be watching out for and we'll we'll yeah. kind of have that in our brains now I think when we look at what's what's going to happen next and I guess if we spoke again in a year Chris what would be the number one thing you would have hoped to have evolved or changed in in the business that you're working in or in your career I would love I've been living and breathing open banking and payments for the last six years um, since its advent, I would love to see a great bank transfer product in market that's embedded in all of my environments. And that's what we're working towards. So I'm being a bit opportunistic here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I I want this this whole payments consolidation piece to, to grow out. I think um, I, I've mentioned this a few times, and I don't want to sound boring to the listeners, but this whole idea of security is really important. I want to feel safe with what I'm doing. Do I feel safe in the crypto winter? No. Do I feel safe with buy now, pay later? Not yet. Mm. Um, so we just need to really take cybersecurity 
and anti-fraud technologies really seriously if we want to succeed with a consumer or business-facing brand. Absolutely. So Mm. just as we wrap up our conversation today, what would be your final takeaway message for us on the politics of payments? Oh, on the politics of payments. Now, this one I haven't really thought through, but I I think the big takeaway now, having worked in several businesses, is is to take the focus back to the consumer. Uh, Who owns your data? Who owns your payment? Who owns your bank account? Well, the banks traditionally have laid claim to that. But ultimately, Amber, it's us who own our data. It's us who own our payments choice. And I don't yet see technology up to speed to really recognize that full ownership and control of my finances. So I'd like to see that as a great outcome over the next few years, re-empowering consumers to feel like they are in control. And I think that will have a significant seismic social impact on how we go about our days. Well, you definitely know your stuff and it's been a great conversation covering so much in our time together today. And if you do want to connect further with Christopher Rogers, uh, there will be some details on the show notes. Until next time, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea, you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.